Hey everybody, Sage here, and it's Marchintage! So what better way to celebrate than to talk more about my treasured Macintosh Classic. Now, for those who haven't seen my computer showcase video on this, feel free to check that out. But for now, I want to talk about the story behind my system, the restoration, and how I did it. So sit back, grab some popcorn, and enjoy. So the story behind this computer dates back to way before I was even born. My dad bought this Macintosh Classic from a client many moons ago, complete with keyboard, mice, bag, and everything. As a young kid, I was fascinated by this little machine, but over the years it started to have issues, particularly with the checkerboard screen on startup. But it would eventually boot into the OS, albeit with no sound. But I didn't know what caused that issue at the time. But then sometime after 2010, the system stopped working entirely, and I completely forgot about it afterwards. So fast forward to several years later, 2017. I happened to volunteer at a local church, and they had a prop room with a few interesting items there. One of which was another Macintosh Classic, and I tested it. And it actually works. It was a bit dirty though, but I could take care of that fast. So after some talks, I ended up borrowing it for a very outdated review that I did back in 2017. And while it did have some very apparent problems, which we'll get to later, it was bootable with a floppy. But I only needed it for that review. So after all was said and done, I returned the system back to them. And it was left there for about three years. But I had the intentions to use that machine for a restoration project that was to begin in 2020 and I had this all planned out. But then the pandemic threw a wrench into those plans. But finally, in early 2021, after some more talks, I was able to get my hands on that system once again for the restoration project. And in return, I would give them a non-working unit as a prop. So let's look at the classics we're dealing with here. Starting with machine number one, manufactured back in April of 1991. The exterior looks to be in pretty good shape, but as I mentioned earlier, it did have some hardware issues. As well as that, there was some screen burn on the CRT. It looked like it might have been used as a file server at one point, judging by the faint AppleShare logo. Now let's move on to machine number two, manufactured a little earlier in January of 1991. This particular unit is more yellowed than the first, but as I mentioned before, it is bootable, and unlike the other machine, the CRT doesn't have any screen burn, so that's a good sign. So the main goal of this restoration was to get one of these systems in good working order. The plan was to take both units apart, swap out the good and bad parts from both systems, and that should result in both a working and non-working system respectively. And as I mentioned earlier, I would return the non-working unit with unsalvageable parts and focus on getting the other unit in fully working order. Before I do begin, however, I will need to use some special tools, a normal Phillips screwdriver, a flat tip screwdriver, and a long-handled T15 Torx driver, the latter of which is essential to take the back cover off of both units, as you'll see later on. So I started with machine number two for the disassembly. I always put a towel down to avoid any scratches on the front when working on a system like this. There are four Torx screws holding the back cover on, two near the bottom and two deep inside the handle. This is where the long-handled Torx driver comes in handy. However, the back cover wouldn't budge, at least near the top of the unit. So I had to use a flat tip screwdriver to get the rest of the case off, whilst trying not to damage the plastic any further. Next, I need to take out the RAM expansion card, then disconnect any cables going to the hard drive, floppy drive, and power supply from the logic board. No tools were needed to remove the logic board. It just slides right out. The logic board in machine number two was rather dusty, plus there were signs of electrolytic capacitor leakage here and there, as to be expected. The original battery on this board was a no-name blue colored battery that was already dead but thankfully didn't leak. I went ahead and replaced it with a brand new one I ordered off of Amazon. Moving on, the next step was to take the bracket holding the hard drive and the floppy drive out, held in by four Phillips screws to the chassis. I tried my best not to touch any of the high voltage components as I took the entire bracket out. This machine had a quantum SCSI hard drive, which, as I suspected, was completely dead. So now comes the CRT. Now, fair warning, it's not a great idea to mess around with high voltage components, especially a CRT, and for good reason. You can kill yourself with these if you're not careful, but as long as you take the proper precautions, it should be safe. From what I've heard, these old Macs have bleeder resistors that automatically discharge the CRT within a few minutes of it being powered off. But I'm not willing to take the risk, so I played it safe by discharging the CRT first before I go any further. 
To do the procedure, I had to get out my flat tip screwdriver, along with some alligator clip test leads. I attached the one end of the wire to the metal part of the screwdriver, making sure it's held tight, and then the other end to the ground lug of the CRT. Then I inserted the screwdriver underneath the CRT's anode cap until I reached the metal piece at the center. If it sparks, then that means it's discharged, but in my case it didn't, so it was already discharged. Now, the first time taking the anode cap out wasn't easy, but I eventually got it out, at least the suction cup part of it. After getting the metal clip out, I discovered that both it and the suction cup, which make up the anode cap, are held together with one screw. So that repair ended up being rather easy, but I'll try to be more careful next time. Next, I had to take the video board off the back of the tube, before moving on to the analog board, held to the chassis by two Phillips screws. The analog board is essentially the power supply, controlling the high voltage components for both the computer and the monitor. I also needed to disconnect the fan, the yoke cable that connects to the CRT, and of course, the ground lug. And then comes the CRT itself, which is held to the front cover by four Torx screws. Again, this is where the long Torx driver comes in handy. And then comes the chassis, which is also held to the front cover by four Torx screws. So with that out of the way, let's move on to machine number one. I took it apart pretty much the same way I did the previous unit, but when I went to take the logic board out, it was stuck to the chassis. And if we take another look at the board from a different angle, you can see why. Yep, there was corrosion. Clearly, something went horribly wrong. With a little bit of force, I was able to get the logic board out. Now, this wasn't the first time I had seen damage like this. Before I got the proper Torx driver, I had a bit of a MacGyvered Torx driver to get the back cover off. And the first time I saw the damage, I was pretty stunned. It was quite surprising how much rust had built up on the chassis. The logic board itself was a different story, however. I was expecting way worse, but it was still decimated. The battery holder was missing, the capacitors have leaked pretty badly, and there was quite a bit of nasty corrosion on the board, most notably in the upper right corner, which is clearly battery acid. So yeah, this board was pretty much toast. As I mentioned earlier, most of the damage was on the chassis, so that definitely needed some replacing as well. The inside of the back cover also had some battery acid all over, but I was able to clean it off just fine but I needed to take apart the rest of the machine before I go any further. Now, the hard drive in this unit is a Connor branded one, which, as I mentioned before, still works. Now to take care of the CRT. As before, I needed to take the proper precautions, and once again there was no spark, so it should be all safe now. And I did manage to get the anode cap out in one piece, so all's well that ends well. After disconnecting some more components, I came to the yoke cable on the analog board, which at first wouldn't budge. After I got it out with some force, I noticed that the connector has a burn mark. I wonder what caused that. So now came the CRT, and then finally the rusted chassis. As I took the chassis out, I noticed something dropped on the floor. And yep, it was the battery. Okay, so let me sidetrack for a bit because this is important. Much like with the leaking capacitors, batteries have also been brought up when it comes to issues with these older Macs. You see, back in the late 80s all the way up into the early 2000s, Apple used a half-size AA battery to store important PRAM settings like the clock, but is also essential to boot the computer up. Now, this isn't necessarily a problem if you use a battery from, say, Tataron or Saft, just to name a few. The real problem lies in a specific brand of batteries used all the way up into the late 90s, the Maxell Super Lithium. Now, the problem with this kind of battery was that once it died, it had a tendency to not only leak, but leak hard, causing all sorts of damage that may render the logic board beyond repair. This particular unit, unfortunately, fell victim to this. So the moral here is, if you have one of those pesky Maxell batteries in there, what are you doing? Get rid of it. These things are literally a ticking time bomb. Anyways, just wanted to get that message out there, even if it is too late. So now with both computers disassembled, it was time to do the part swap. Now obviously, I'll be taking the logic board out from the second unit and putting it into the first unit, since that one is much more salvageable. As for the CRT, it's also no contest. I'll be taking the one from the second unit and putting it into the first unit. And of course, I'll be swapping the chassis out. The one on the right is pretty much trash, aside from the fan, which was apparently manufactured by Canon, a company known for making cameras and printers. 
So with that said, it was time to reassemble. I did give both the front cover and the chassis a good cleaning before I put it all back together. I also did clean off some of the cap juice with some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip in the infected areas before I put the logic board back in, so that should get it working, at least temporarily. Okay, so now the first unit was put back together without the back cover, so now it was time to turn the system on. The hard drive powered on, and things were going pretty well up until it froze on the Happy Mac screen. After taking out the RAM expansion card, however, it did go a little further. Sort of. So I put the RAM expansion card back in for now, and after a few tries, it did manage to get to the desktop. Of course, I couldn't hear any audio coming out of the speaker, but then again, that shouldn't surprise me at all, considering the capacitors leaked. But for now, the system is somewhat usable like this. So now the next thing was to get the capacitors replaced. Now, I'm no expert at soldering. The last time I did some was many moons ago, and it was from a kit that I never bothered finishing. But even if I did have some soldering skills, the biggest hurdle for me would have to be the surface mount parts, which are a bit harder to deal with. So I had to leave it to the experts, and I just so happened to know a local business that could do the job well. Now, I didn't get any footage of this, but I went to a local retro tech repair shop not too far from where I am. Not only do they repair electronics, both retro and modern, but they also sell retro games. And I ended up buying some retro gaming stuff there, but I was mainly there to check in the computer for repair. I explained my situation to them, and by the way, they've dealt with surface mount capacitors before, and they told me the turnaround time would be about two to three weeks. After about three to four weeks, I got a call back from them and said that the computer was ready to be picked up. So I went back, picked up the system, paid a fair price for the repair, and here were the results. For the record, here's what the logic board looked like before the repair. And here's what it looked like after the repair. All of the surface mount capacitors were replaced, and the board was also cleaned. Some of the corrosion on the chips that had existed before has also been cleaned off. Well, for the most part. But I still had to take care of another issue. The memory. Even after the capacitor replacement, the system still kept freezing during startup. So I decided to take out the RAM sims from the expansion card and cleaned them using some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip. And sure enough, that took care of the problem. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get any footage of this, but out of curiosity, I put the RAM expansion card back in without the sims. But when I went to turn it on, the system started making some weird high-pitched noises and I got a very garbled mess on the screen. I knew something was off, so I immediately shut it down. But then I later discovered that there was a jumper on the top of the card, where you could switch between SIM installed and SIM not installed. I set the jumper to the ladder, put it back in, turned it on, and sure enough, it worked perfectly. So I guess you learn something new every day. So anyways, with the memory issue resolved, the system was now working fine. When this computer was first obtained, it came with System 7.0, along with a copy of Microsoft Works 2. The installation of System 7 was nothing to brag about, however, the battery desk accessory was installed for some reason, despite it clearly not being a portable. I was also pretty curious about this Mac OS Setup Assistant thing, but it ended up being a text file that I wrote many years ago. I decided to check the last modified date to see how long ago it was the last time I used this hard drive, and sure enough, it was around March of 2010, sometime before the old logic board kicked the bucket. But at least it was great to hear sound coming out of this old Macintosh again, probably for the first time in my life. Despite the major issues being resolved, however, there were still a couple other problems. For one, the reset button doesn't work. It does freeze the system, but it won't go further and reset. This may have been caused by the corrosion from the old capacitors, but I couldn't really do anything about it. Also, I noticed the CRT screen was a bit jiggly whenever there was hard drive activity. I'm not sure why it does that. Maybe it's a thing with the analog board, but as long as it doesn't affect how the system operates, I should be fine. So now the last part of the restoration was to reinstall the software. Now, I never intended to keep System 7 on there, so I opted to reinstall its original operating system, System 6. Now, the good news is that I don't have to obtain proprietary floppies to do that. As the Macintosh Classic has a standard 1.44 megabyte floppy drive, also known as the Super Drive, not the optical disk kind, the process of creating installation disks should be pretty easy. However, in order to get the installation files onto the floppies, I needed help from a certain Windows laptop that I covered in a previous computer showcase, along with an external floppy drive. 
Using a program called HFV Explorer, I was able to read the System6 installation files from their respective disk images. As the program wouldn't recognize the IMG files, I had to rename them to a DSK. The image write process took a while, but I was able to create two installation disks from scratch, and then labeled them accordingly. So now the next step was to put in the system startup disk. The system booted straight to it no problem, plus it was nice to hear that good old floppy drive noise while it was loading. Before I do reinstall the software, however, I should probably reformat the hard drive. After all, I do want to start fresh. Now, I have opened the Apple HDSC setup program before, but it was in an emulator and I would always get this drive selection failed message every time. So you could imagine what it was like being able to actually use the thing. After about a few minutes, the initialization process finished, so now it was time to reinstall the system software. Not without renaming the hard drive first. When I first loaded up the installer app, it took a little longer than expected. About two and a half minutes to be exact. Eventually though, it did load. I went ahead and did a custom install, as I saw no reason to have any printer drivers, as I don't own any Apple printers at the moment. So I just did a basic system software installation. But when I went to click install, it took an awfully long time to prepare installation. After about two minutes though, it threw me an error message saying that the installer script was corrupted. I then had to wait another two minutes for the error message to disappear. I then tried an easy install, but that didn't work either. Now, at first I thought the floppy disks were the issue, so I tried another set, but neither of them changed anything. The first backup did boot, albeit with an Apple Share error on startup, but the installer app refused to launch at all. The second backup booted pretty fast, but when I went to open the installer, it just threw me back to the desktop. So, third time's the charm, and it looked like I was making progress. But then about midway through installation, I got an error saying that the hard drive had a problem, and switching to an easy install didn't do jack. But it did at least copy some system files to the hard drive, but when I tried to boot from it, I got the blinking question mark. So in a last ditch effort, I went to an emulator and copied the installation files to some blank DSK files, transferred them over USB to my Windows PC, wrote the images to both disks again, crossed my fingers, and lo and behold, it worked. So I'm guessing what happened was that renaming the original disk images from IMG to DSK caused some sort of corruption, which explains why I got those random errors. So I guess that's another thing to keep in mind when doing stuff like this. And no, I didn't bother trying WinImage. So with installation progressing, it was time to insert the System Editions disk. This was probably the first time I ever had to swap floppy disks on real hardware. I've been quite used to emulation to the point that it feels like I've done this before so many times. After installation finished, it was time to boot to the new system software on the hard drive, and I went ahead and enabled MultiFinder so I could have the multitasking features in System 6. I also went ahead and installed some extra software, such as the After Dark screensavers, along with the original Macintosh productivity suite consisting of Mac Write, Mac Paint, and Mac Draw, as well as a bunch of old games, because that's really what these computers are good at these days. Out of curiosity, I also tried out some of the newer games that work on this machine, such as Lemmings, which does work and is playable, as long as you don't have too many of those furry creatures on the screen. I also tried the original Incredible Machine, and while it does run on the system, it was insanely slow on the animated title screen, and I'm talking like only a couple frames per second. But once you get past it, it is somewhat playable, but obviously it was designed to run on much newer computers in mind. So at this point, you'd think the story would be over. But in the words of Billy Mays, I'm not done yet. So it had been more than a week since I tinkered with the machine. So I decided to pull it out one day just to check on how it's doing. But when I turned it on, guess what showed up? The checkerboard screen. Now I will admit, I was in the machine shortly after I got it back from the repair shop, mainly to check on the work they did. But as far as I recall, the system was working perfectly fine up until a week later. I tried taking out the RAM expansion card, I even tried to clean the logic board a bit, but to no avail. At first I thought it was an analog board issue, but I later discovered that it wasn't, and that the logic board was ultimately at fault. Luckily the repair was under warranty, so I took it back to the shop to get it inspected and hopefully have some of the minor issues like the reset button fixed. But then the guy who was working on the repair left and the machine ended up being stuck in the shop for about six months. After some back and forth with the customer service guys, who were really nice by the way, I finally got the machine back, without a refund. 
but at least they did allow me to get one free item from their shop. So I picked up the Super Game Boy for my Super Nintendo. But I was left with a non-working Macintosh Classic for about a year. While I was getting my Mac Classic back from the repair shop, I was in contact with some people who were experts at repairing vintage Macs. While that was going on, however, I decided to take the logic board out of the machine and put it in storage, just so I don't have to take the machine apart constantly to get to it. But then one day in February of 2022, I took the board out and decided to scrub it clean with some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush. I was expecting it not to work when I went to power the machine on, but when I did, it bonged. The system came back to life, and all it took was a trusty toothbrush dipped in alcohol to make it happen. So now the machine is, for the most part, working again. However, there's still the issue with the reset button, the computer crashing on startup sometimes, among other things. But that will have to be taken care of some other time. So while the computer restoration itself is pretty much done, for now, the full restoration is not quite over, as I have yet to restore some of the peripherals, like the keyboard, the mouse, and the external floppy drive. But I'll save those for another time. So after all that hard work and planning, would I recommend getting a system like this if you are getting into collecting vintage Macs? Sadly, I'm going to have to say no. If you are going to get into vintage Mac collecting, I would suggest getting something like a Power Macintosh G4. They're far more reliable, easy to repair, and they'll continue to run for many years to come if you take care of them properly. And you could still run your old software on it just fine. The Macintosh Classic and other vintage Macs like this have common problems that require some expertise to step in, especially when it gets to the point where you have to replace certain parts, like the capacitors, which come at a cost to repair such issues if you don't have the skill. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why couldn't you use something like emulation to run the old software? Thing is, I could've, and still can. But there's just something about running it on the real native hardware. I also had a lot of fun with this project, and learned a lot from this experience, so there's that. It was also the first time I ever restored a vintage Macintosh like this, and it probably won't be my last, but who knows. For now though, I'm going to call this a win. While I'm glad I could finally get the machine working once again, it's only a matter of time before something happens to it, so I'll have to keep a sharp eye on it. But seeing how I've already spent too much time on this project, I think it's best that I move on for now. Anyways, I hope you learned something new during my rambles, and that should about wrap it up for my contribution to Marchintosh. Be sure to subscribe to my channel where I usually post vlog videos there, including a computer showcase on the very system you saw me restore. For now though, thanks very much for watching, and I will see you all next time. Take care.